to create a global regime to ban and control tools of torture and capital punishment. We are here to discuss what has been done and what is to be done in the near future. The road ahead is exciting, but also challenging as the title of our event suggests. But as we stand at this important turning point, our events allows us to make a timely intervention to discuss and assess these challenges and opportunities. It's our hope that the conversations we start here will continue and more and more of you will join this noble cause. Today we have a remarkable line of speakers and I am the only one standing between you and them, so I will cut my part short. But I would like to set some ground rules before passing the floor to our eminent speakers. As you already know, the norms of online interactions are slightly different. Please spell out your full names on the Zoom so that we know who you are. Please keep your microphones off and cameras on to allow us to have a lively discussion as if we are all in the same room. Please also remember that you're welcome to write comments or questions you may have in the chat function. I will make sure to get to them during the Q&A session. I would like to also give you a short overview of our program. We will hear opening remarks from the head of the EU delegation to the UN, Ambassador Olaf Skog, and permanent representative of Argentina to the UN, Ambassador Maria del Carmen Squiff. We will then have keynote speeches from the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michel Bachelet, and the EU Special Representative for Human Rights, Eamon Gilmore. Then the Chief of Rule of Law and Democracy Section of the OECHR, Cecil Aptel, will present the report of the UN Secretary General. We will then hear a regional perspective from Dr. Nicola Wenzel from the Steering Committee of Human Rights at the Council of Europe. We will then have a panel composed of members of civil society organizations and academia and follow it with a Q&A session, which will be open to the general audience as well. We will in particular hear from Dr. Michael Crowley from the Omega Research Foundation, Rajat Kosla from Amnesty International and Professor Manfred Nowak, Secretary General of the Global Campus of Human Rights. And last but not the least, we will hear closing remarks from Hilda Hardeman, Director of the Service for Foreign Policy Instruments. Without further ado, I would like to invite the EU Ambassador Olaf Skog to give his opening remarks. Ambassador, floor is yours. Thank you so much um, and good, uh, good afternoon uh, to you, Esgi, and to everyone in Geneva and good morning to everyone here in uh, New York. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very, very warm welcome to our event on torture-free trade, uh, which of course falls in connection with the International Human Rights Day. I wanted to first welcome um, uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michel Bachelet. Thank you for being a very frequent uh, participant at various um, events that we organize. And of course, to our special representative for human rights, Eamon Gilmore, uh, both who will deliver keynote remarks, as well as uh, dear, my dear friend, um, the co-chair, Maria del Carmen Squef of Argentina, um, and of course, to our civil society panelists. Colleagues, earlier this year, the UN Secretary General called us to put human rights and human dignity at the heart of all our efforts. The UN member states answered his call to action in the UN at 75th anniversary declaration by recommitting to ensure the human rights and fundamental freedoms of everyone. The objective of the Alliance for Torture Free Trade, a cross regional initiative created in 2017 to prevent, restrict and ban the trading goods used for capital punishment, torture and other cruel and inhumane treatment is a very concrete translation of that commitment into action. The acts they seek to prevent are abhorrent violations of human rights. The international community has been united in its condemnation of torture. 171 states have ratified the UN Convention Against Torture and have thereby pledged to take effective legislative, administrative, judicial or other measures to prevent acts of torture in their territory. Yet there is no rule at the international level to regulate the trading goods used for torture and other cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment. While the number of countries supplying the death penalty continues to decrease, torture is still practiced, sometimes systematically. 
A milestone was reached last year with the adoption by the General Assembly of Resolution 73304, which expressed the commitment of the majority of UN member states to put an end to torture trade. Pursuant to the resolution, the Secretary General recently published a feasibility study outlining best practices, notably based on the two 2005 EU regulation on the trading goods that could be used for capital punishment or torture. A group of experts should now be established to take work forward. Time is of the essence. We will hear in a few minutes from the High Commissioner about her office's plans to swiftly establish the group. The group should be made of qualified experts who are committed to the objectives set out in Resolution 73304 of a world without torture and capital punishment. As we will hear from EU Special Representative Eamon Gilmore, the EU is ready to do its part. We have had a regulation in place for the last 15 years, and the advancement of torture-free trade is a priority of the new EU Action Plan for Human Rights. We stand ready to support the group of, of experts and look forward to its recommendations, and we look forward to the discussion today. Thank you very much again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Ambassador Sko. We are now most privileged to hear also from the Ange Argentinian Ambassador Maria del Carmen Squiff. Ambassador. Yes, yes. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, dear distinguished colleague, Argentina is happy to sponsor this timely event with the European Union. Thank you, Olof. And uh, we are honored to be uh, one of the member states and that co-leads the Alliance for Torture Free Trade. And thank you, the presence and the and participation of Michelle Bachelet. Argentina has a firm position in the fight against the death penalty and torture, and the participation in this initiative allow us to effectively strengthen our efforts in that fight at the national and international levels. Our strong commitment is also reflected by the ratification of the Convention Against Torture in 1986, which has constitution standing, standing and it is optional protocol. We are convinced an ending trade of products used for torture and death penalty is a very powerful tool to eradicate this courage and to achieve a global moratorium on the use of the death penalty. In that sense, immediate and concrete action is needed and this alliance is the first step in the right di direction. As a second step, the adoption of the resolution 73-304 at the General Assembly in 2019 has been crucial to make progress in this area. Not only does the report gather the views and experiences of member states to establish common international standard in this topic, but it also mandates the creation of a group of governmental experts to examine this issue in detail. We know for sure that this intergovernmental group of experts will be a key tool to strengthen cooperation and to exchange a good national practices among member states. We do, we do hope that this group will start working as soon as possible. Yesterday was the International Human Rights Day, which is an occasion to reflect on what member states and the international community as a whole have been doing since the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In our UN events, you usually mention that we need to build back better from the devastating pandemic that is affecting so many people in the world. Dear colleagues, build back better also mean advancing on human right issues. Let's do better when it comes to enhance our human rights standards to eliminate the death penalty and torture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Ambassador. Now it's time for keynote speeches. It's my pleasure to offer the floor to High Commissioner Bachelet.
Thank you very much, Excellencies, colleagues, greetings. In a very challenging context for human rights, the Global Alliance for Torture-Free Trade has been a strong and welcome initiative, a framework for practical steps to improve respect for people's dignity and rights around the world. My office was honored to contribute to the Secretary General's report early this year to the General Assembly, examining the feasibility, scope, and parameters for international standards regarding the import for use in capital punishment and or torture. The report, uh, which come, came in follow up, as that being said, to the General Assembly Resolution 73-304, drew on contribution from some 40 states from diverse regions of the world. Our work in this area builds on a number of significant regional developments. They include the European Union's Regulation 2009-125 concerning trade in certain goods for capital punishment, torture, or other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. In the African region, the Robben Island guidelines and measures for the prohibition and prevention of torture, cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment of punished recommended that states, and I will quote, prohibit and prevent the use, production, and trade of equipment or Um, I believe we are having some technical problems right now. Unfortunately, we seem to have uh, to have lost connection with uh, Miss Ashley. Um, all right. Um, maybe she will join us later. Uh, maybe then I will now turn to um, the EU Special Representative Eamon Gilmore to offer his remarks. Thank you very much indeed. Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, it is a great honour to be with you all today to discuss torture free trade and this unique torture free trade alliance in our efforts to combat torture and the death penalty globally. I want to thank uh, uh, EU Ambassador Skog, uh, Ambassador Squeff from Argentina uh, and Director Hilda Hardeman for organising today's timely event and for inviting me to speak. Madam High Commissioner Michel Bachelet, Excellencies, partners and distinguished guests from all over the world. The inherent dignity and the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family are among the opening words of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which turned 72 years old yesterday. Protecting and promoting human rights all over the world lies at the heart of the European Union's identity. It reflects our values and principles. More human rights means more freedom, prosperity, peace and security for all of us. The European Union is strongly committed to the abolition of the death penalty, torture and other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatments or punishment. Torture and other ill treatments are among the most abhorrent violations of human rights, human integrity and human dignity. No exceptions are permitted under international law. Yet despite this absolute pro prohibition, torture and ill treatment persist all over the world. Belarus is the most recent example, among others, where the situation is deteriorating with at least 500 cases of torture documented in the last four months. At the same time, tools of death and implements of pain are still traded across the globe. And that is why we are here today. The eradication of torture is a global challenge. It should be our global ambition. And it is not impossible to achieve, but can only be done if we act together in a coherent manner. Joint efforts with all of you, the United Nations and the Council of Europe, regional organizations, governments, national partners and civil society can bring about the eradication of torture. The Global Alliance for Torture-Free Trade, inspired by the EU's successful anti-torture regulation of 2005, is a unique example of how we can work together in this field. 
I would like to share with you a couple of elements from our work and efforts to combat torture. The European Union uses all its available political and financial tools to combat torture in its external action. This ranges from the protection of victims, including those most vulnerable, to speaking out about abuses, to urging states to comply with their obligations under international law, to investigate allegations of torture, and to bring perpetrators to justice. Both public and discrete diplomacy are crucial. In the context of the pandemic, the European Union has taken action on your uh, call, High Commissioner Bachelet, to reduce the number of people in detention and to examine ways to release those particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. I'm personally engaged at a high political level for the release of individuals or groups of prisoners on humanitarian grounds, together with EU delegations and member states' embassies in several countries. Financial support is also important. Over the last decade, the European Union has allocated more than 80 million euros to support civil society actors and human rights defenders at the forefront of the anti-torture work. Let me give you some examples of that. We support projects aimed at improving detention conditions, combating abuse of pre-trial detention, but also offering legal aid and psychological support to victims of torture. Let me also give you a couple of examples of our support in the area of torture-free trade. We support torture prevention and victims' redress through the establishment of effective controls of trade and of torture-related technology. We raise awareness amongst law enforcement officials of relevant international standards, such as the Nelson Mandela rules for the treatment of prisoners. Just recently in November, all of the EU member states adopted new action plan on human rights and democracy. This is a renewed political roadmap, which sets the EU's priorities for the years to come. Our action plan has an increased focus on business and human rights, including the need for due diligence in the global supply chain. And protecting people is a major priority of the new action plan. It says the following in relation to the subject we are discussing today. The European Union will strive to eradicate torture and cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment globally through prevention, prohibition, accountability and redress for victims, including by promoting the Global Alliance for Torture Free Trade. The action plan will also be backed by the European Union Global Human Rights Sanctions Regime, which was adopted by all EU member states just last Monday. This new regime will further strengthen our collective action on human rights and ensure that perpetrators of human rights violations and abuses, including those related to torture, have nowhere to hide. The need for strong, coherent and effective collective action on torture free trade is more vital than ever. As you all know, it is now 15 years since the European Union first adopted legislation to eradicate trade in certain goods that could be used for capital punishment, torture, or other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment. Such legislation sends a clear signal that it is wrong to sustain such egregious human rights violations through trade. Batons with metal spikes, electric shock belts, gas chambers have no place in this world. This kind of trade must stop. Leading by example, the EU anti-torture regulation brings us here today. Further to the adoption of the uh, General Assembly Resolution on Torture Free Trade in June last year, our aim, together with Argentina and Mongolia, is to establish international standards in this field with all UN member states on board. I would like to express our appreciation for the work of the Office of the High Commissioner in the important follow-up work and in the implementation of this resolution, which the European Union will continue to support. The recent UN Secretary General report on torture free trade is an important milestone in recognizing that common international standards could ensure more effective regulation in this area. Today's event should not only take stock of the progress achieved, but give it further impetus, including for the UN governmental experts work. Today, we renew our support to the Alliance for Torture Free Trade, and we repeat our call on all states to join. I look forward to a fruitful discussion with all of you and how we can create synergies in the fight for torture-free trade 
and how we can coordinate our efforts to make these horrendous practices a thing of the past. We owe it to the victims of torture and to survivors, to their families and to human civilization. The torture of human beings has no place in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, Special Representative Gilmore, for this inspiring speech. I hear uh, Madame Bachelet is uh, with us again. Maybe we can uh, re-welcome her to the floor. Thank you. I don't know where I, where I was. I, start, the, the, I was disconnected, but I, I just tried to say that we think that uh, companies, not only the ones who produce a particular product, that they should uh, guide themselves by the guiding principles of business and human rights, and they should carry on human rights due diligence across their operations to ensure that they are not risking involvement with torture or arbitrary capital punishment through their operations or relationships or in their engagement with states. But I also said that alongside strengthening legal and regulatory regimes, there's a great deal of work to bring police forces away from coercive investigative techniques. Policy build, policing builds greater trust and is more effective when it does not resort to abusive practices. And uh, my office is contributing to the development of a universal protocol on non-coercive techniques for investigative interviews to provide guidance to authorities on how to conduct ethical and efficient interviews without inflicting torture and Ill or ill treatment. Assisting the, the development of UN Paul manual that focuses on this technique. And I strongly encourage swift and decisive action in all these areas my office receives very frequently, and in some regions, increasing reports alleging torture in every region of the world. Government must act to immediately eradicate these shameful and illegal practices, and businesses everywhere should ensure they do not get involved in them in any way. The Secretary General's report also emphasizes that the establishment of common international standards are much more effective regulation and therefore protection in this area. Nominations of the governmental experts who will look further into the feasibility, scope, and potential parameters of common international standards in this area are currently in their final stages. My office looks forward to supporting the work of this group. And by this time next year, the General Assembly will have received their reports and recommendations how to move forward. Excellencies, torture strips away the essence of human beings, humanity, dignity, and self-worth. It demeans, debases, and defiles the victim. Less obviously, it does the same for the torturer, while rendering the torturer criminally liable under national and international law. The struggle to end all forms of torture has long been at the, or at the forefront of the OHCHR world. This fight is not a regional or sectorial issue, but is truly in all of our interests. Um, I believe we uh, lost Madam Commissioner again. Uh, maybe we can um, move on with the um, report we promised you. We are most privileged to hear about the UN Secretary General's report from Cecile Abdel from the OHCHR. Ms. Abdel, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon from Geneva. Excellencies, dear colleagues and friends, Thank you for inviting me to participate in today's events and for this opportunity to present the United Nations Secretary General's report, which is entitled Towards Torture-Free Trade, examining the feasibility, scope, and parameters for possible common international standards. The report was prepared pursuant to General Assembly Resolution 73-304, where the General Assembly requested the Secretary General to seek the views of member states on the feasibility and possible scope of a range of options to establish common international standards for the import, export, and transfer of goods used for A, capital punishment, B, torture, or other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. In March of this year, on behalf of the Secretary General, the High Commissioner addressed an ad verbal to all member states with a detailed questionnaire, inviting them to share information on relevant regional and national legal frameworks and to express views on the type, feasibility and scope of common international standards for trade in the 
aforementioned goods. 46 member states responded to the not verbal and to the questionnaire. The report, which was recently published, is a compilation and analysis of the inputs received. The report covers several areas that are important when discussing the feasibility and the possible scope of the proposed standards. It provides information on existing regional and national frameworks and other measures in countries that provided input. The information we received demonstrate an uneven situation at both the regional and national levels regarding the regulation in this area. A majority of states that responded referred to the European Union regulation 2019-125. Some states noted that while they have not adopted specific legislation addressing such trade, they have addressed relevant aspects in other legislative acts. The report also looked into the implementation of national legislation and penalties provided in, case of, in cases of violations of such laws. Penalties range from fines to lengthy prison terms for offenses committed with aggravating circumstances. The report analyzed the views of member states on the scope and categories of goods to be covered under the proposed common international standards. Several member states indicated that goods that have no practical use other than for the purpose of capital punishment, torture, or other forms of ill treatment be separated from goods that could be used for such purpose. Even though the types of goods were not discussed in detail, some countries enumerated the type of good that they would like to the standards to cover. A majority of member states suggested that the list of goods should be exhaustive to ensure consistency in the application of the standards and also that that list should be updated regularly. It was also proposed that standards should not create unnecessary barriers to trading goods that are used for legitimate purposes. The prohibition of trade in goods that have no practical use other than for the purpose of capital punishment, torture, or other forms of ill treatment was approved by most states that provided input. Similarly, the majority of states that provided input indicated the need for control with regard to goods that could be used for such purpose. Activities that should be included in the scope of common international standards encompass brokering services, technical assistance, training in the use of regulated goods, promotion at trade fairs or exhibitions, and advertising. The scope of the EU regulation 2019-125 I've mentioned earlier covers similar activities. Submissions also indicated the need to prohibit the production and manufacture of goods that have no practical use other than for the purpose of capital punishment, torture, or other forms of ill treatment. The UN report has a dedicated section on the need for a risk assessment mechanism and criteria for risk assessment. Member states noted the importance of export authorization requirements and end use verification as appropriate mechanisms for inclusion in the scope of common international standards. A number of countries suggesting, suggested building on the existing international and regional treaties, agreements and regulations on dual use goods, such as the Vanessa Agreement, the Vassana Agreement. The Secretary General highlighted that in the report that the guiding principles on business and human rights should be used as a basis for further discussions on common international standard in this area. The due diligence required from companies trading the above mentioned goods under the guiding principles is complementary to the efforts of states in regulating trade in goods that could be used for capital punishment, torture, or other forms of ill treatment. Importantly, most states that provided input to the questionnaire were in favor of a legally binding instrument. Some specifically referred to a convention or a further optional protocols to the Convention Against Torture and other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. However, some states preferred a non-binding instruments or non-binding international standards, 
and called for flexibility until the scope of the standards are further defined. Excellencies, dear colleagues, we hope that the group of governmental experts, which was already mentioned before, and which will soon be established, will benefit from the views expressed by the member states in the Secretary General report as a basis for further deliberations. We also hope that member states from all regions and representative of the civil society will be able to contribute to the work of the group of governmental experts so as to further define the feasibility, scope of the goods to be included and draft parameters for a range of options to establish common international standards so as to shape a wide consensus on the issue of torture free trade. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Aptel, for offering a comprehensive overview of the report. And I would encourage our audience to go ahead and this report, as uh, Ms. Aptel explained, it's an in extremely rich and informative report. So uh, now I would like to move from global to regional and hear from uh, Dr. Nicola Wenzel from the Council of Europe. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it is a great pleasure and honor to have been invited to contribute the regional perspective on torture-free trade to, to, to today's event. And the perspective I am going to present is the perspective of the Council of Europe. And to be more precise, I'm going to present the draft recommendation of the Council of Europe's Committee of Ministers to Member States. Now comes a very long title on measures against the trade of goods used for death penalty, torture, or other cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. And I will proceed in four steps. I will start by explaining the current status of the recommendation. Uh, then I will provide a brief overview of the origins and the drafting process. Third, I will present to you the main parameters of the recommendation. And finally, I will highlight uh, one or two aspects that I find particularly interesting. So where do we stand uh, in the Council of Europe today? We have a draft of the recommendation that was very recently adopted by the Council of Europe's Steering Committee for Human Rights. Uh, the Steering Committee conducts the intergovernmental work of the Council of Europe and advises the Committee of Ministers in Human Rights Matters. And it is the CDDH, uh, the Steering Committee, that is the body that has uh, drafted the recommendation. So the steering committee adopted the recommendation and has transmitted it to the Committee of Ministers for adoption, hopefully in February of next year. Uh, right now, work is undergoing in the steering committee on an explanatory memorandum to uh, the recommendation of the Committee of Ministers. Second, how did we get there? In 2018, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe adopted a recommendation on international regulations uh, against the trade in goods used for torture. And at the beginning of this recommendation, the Parliamentary Assembly sets out very clearly the legal background uh, to this um, recommendation, namely the prohibition of torture and inhuman and degrading treatment and punishment in all circumstances. And the Parliamentary Assembly made very clear that this prohibition is so strict that it requires states to take actions that, against activities that may occur in other countries. That is the, the torture aspect. The other aspect is the death penalty aspect. As you know, the death penalty is, an, is unlawful in all uh, member states of the Council of Europe. So uh, based on these legal, uh, legal arguments, the Parliamentary Assembly, and I would like to quote, considers that on the basis of these existing legal obligations, Council of Europe member states are required to take effective measures to prevent activity within their jurisdiction that might contribute to or facilitate capital punishment, torture, and inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment in other countries. 
including by effectively regulating the trade in goods that may be used for such purposes. The Parliamentary Assembly also encouraged the Committee of Ministers to consider adopting a recommendation setting out the technical guidance, a technical guidance for the establishment of a regulatory regime. The Committee of Ministers answered uh, the Parliamentary Assembly, highlighted the pioneering role of the Council of Europe in combating torture and um, the death penalty and concluded that the Council of Europe should contribute a framework against trade in torture tools. It tasked the steering committee first with a feasibility study and later on with the drafting of the recommendation. Now, these details are not that interesting to you. What is important, in my view, is that the whole process was based on three principles. First of all, we have a very strong consensus in all organs of the Council of Europe, the Parliamentary Assembly and the, and the Committee of Ministers that the trade with tools of torture must end and that common efforts of states are needed to this end. And I remember very well when, when the feasibility study was presented in the steering committee for human rights with examples given and also uh, shown. We had photographs of um, the kinds of goods that are still being traded in Council of Europe member states. Um, the atmosphere was on the one hand shocked that something like this could be going on in the Council of Europe, but on the other hand, uh, quiet but very strong determination that this must end. So this is one the first principle, a strong consensus that we have to end the trade in torture tools. The second principle is the common understanding that the prohibition of torture requires states not only to abstain from torturing, but also uh, implies the obligation to take measures to prevent torture, such as regulations of the kind we're discussing today. The third principle that I think is very important is an agreement that civil society needs to be involved in the whole process. We have had uh, long consultations with uh, civil society and beyond that, even strong involvement in uh, the drafting process. Michael Crowley, who will take the floor later on, uh, acted as consultant expert and his expertise and input was essential um, in the whole process. So what are the main parameters of the recommendation of the Council of Europe? And I will concentrate, as uh, I don't have much time, on the issues and questions um, that were addressed in the report by the Secretary General that we just heard about. Um, but before going into the details, I um, would like to recall that 27 of the 47 Council of Europe member states are also member states of the European Union. And so that uh, explains the choices that were made and the uh, reason is the reason why uh, the recommendation we now have is very heavily influenced by uh, the rules, the, the EU anti-torture um, regulation. So first of all, the scope and categories of goods covered and the question, is trade prohibited or is trade controlled? The recommendation distinguish, distinguishes three categories of goods. First of all, inherently abusive equipment, and that includes equipment used for the uh, imposition of capital punishment. Um, to give you an example, the, the, the list um, appended to, to the recommendation um, names, for example, guillotines, gallows, thumb cuffs, finger cuffs, um, just to give you a, 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 an idea about what is included. So with respect to inherently abusive equipment, the trade is prohibited. The second category is equipment that can have a legitimate function, but may also be misused to torture um, people. So dual use goods. These kinds of goods or trade in, with this kinds of goods is controlled through an authorization or a licensing system. The third category of goods are certain pharmaceutical chemicals that are used in lethal injection executions. Uh, with respect to these um, chemicals, the trade is also controlled. The recommendation does not contain an exhaustive list of goods. 
but rather a minimum list. And member states are invited to consider adding further um, further goods or equipment to their national lists, and also to regularly revise those national lists. And the recommendation um, states that the, the implementa its implementation is to be examined not later than five years after its adoption. And this will be an occasion to also review the list um, that is attached to the Council of Europe recommendation and to uh, possibly uh, review whether new items should be included. The activities covered by the recommendation include, first of all, import, export, and transit, but also technical assistance, training, brokering, advertisement, and promotion at trade fairs. Um, the details depend on whether which category of good is concerned, but I will not go into these details right now. Um, the, the last question concerns um, whether we have a binding or a non-binding instrument. The Council of Europe chose the approach of having a recommendation, meaning a non-binding instrument, but the reason is not that uh, a non-binding instrument was seen as a better choice uh, in general in this area, but rather um, the Council of Europe was very aware about the discussions going on at the international level about a possible instrument. So the idea was we want to quickly improve things um, at the regional level. We also want to send a sign to the international community of the Council of Europe's commitment in this field. And that is why we chose to adopt um, a non-binding recommendation at this stage. The recommendation itself explicitly embeds uh, the Council of Europe regime in the international efforts in regulating uh, trade in torture tools. It calls on member states to join the Alliance um, for Torture Free Trade, those member states who have not yet done so. And it also states that member states should promote action in relevant international fora, and again explicitly mentions the UN process um, that brings us here today. So finally, I would like to highlight two additional aspects of the Council of Europe recommendation that I find particularly interesting. And first of all, uh, it is that the recommendation draws the link uh, between trade and torture tools and the international standards that exist with respect to business um, and human rights. We have already heard the UNGP mentioned several times, and this is a link in my view that could and should be further explored in the future. The second aspect is um, a knowledge sharing um, platform the, that is um, that, that is foreseen by, by the recommendation. Um, as you might know, the Council of Europe already has a business and human rights platform that is used for sharing information among member states, but also to provide information to all stakeholders, service society, but also the business community. And this a uh, business and human rights platform is going to be used to also uh, share knowledge on um, measures against trade in torture tools. And that might be an interesting way of following up on the recommendation. So, as you have seen in the Council of Europe, we have a very strong commitment to combat the trade in goods used for torture. And we are determined to bring this commitment to the international level as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wenzel, for this informative in intervention. And we will now continue widening the perspectives we cover today. And we will hear from a panel of speakers from civil society organizations and academia. Uh, as I've announced before, we have Dr. Michael Crowley, Rajat Kosla, and Professor Manfred Nowak as panelists. I would like to start with Michael. So, uh, Michael, you've been working with the Omega Research Foundation and documenting the production and use of tools of torture and capital punishment. Can you please give us an a overview of the state of the trade and the tools available in the marketplace today? Right. Yeah. Um, thanks, Esgi. And good afternoon, everybody. 
Um, I'll start uh, talking and then um, I will try and sh I will try and show some slides. And if it all goes horribly wrong, hopefully our friends in uh, New York will be able to, to help me. OK, so um, the Omega Research Foundation, which is where I work, is a non-governmental organization that investigates the manufacture, promotion and trade of law enforcement equipment used in torture and other ill treatment. Our research has uncovered a relatively narrow range of inherently abusive equipment currently manufactured and promoted to the law enforcement community by a limited number of companies, albeit operating in all regions of the world. Now, the production, trade and use of all such goods must be ended. A second category of goods of concern is law enforcement equipment, which can have a legitimate function if used in compliance with international human rights law. Um, but which can and are readily misused for torture and ill treatment. And this encompasses a far broader range of goods, many of which are produced and traded on a significant scale by a large number of companies throughout the world. The trade in all such goods must be strictly controlled with no transfers authorised to law enforcement agencies likely to misuse them for torture. And now I'd like to start sharing my screen. Sorry, here we go. Up. Okay. Go back a bit. But sorry, apologies. Let's go there. Okay. Okay. So um, this trade is uh, international in nature, with many companies promoting and supplying their products to law enforcement bodies within uh, their own countries and to other states in their regions and also to customers worldwide. Whilst um, global marketing is of course conducted via the internet, Omega has documented over 50 specialized arms and security equipment trade fairs and exhibitions. And they are held regularly in at least 36 countries, mostly on an annual or biennial basis. And in many instances, facilitated and actively supported by the host state. Over the years, Amnesty International and Omega have uncovered the promotion of inherently abusive equipment at a number of these events, uh, documented in our latest joint publication, Ending the Torture Trade, which was released today and which uh, Rajat is going to uh, talk about. At the moment, only a minority of states currently regulate the trade in law enforcement equipment. Few, however, of these uh, provide public information on this licensed trade. And where they do, this information is only uh, very often partial or and infrequently published. Consequently, there are no accurate, independently verifiable global figures on the number of companies involved. However, despite the lack of official state information, I'd like to give you now uh, an indication of the range of law enforcement equipment of concern that Omega has discovered being actively promoted by companies in today's international marketplace. A range of electroshock uh, devices are intended specifically for attachment directly to prisoners' bodies. And these uh, can be activated by remote control. They include stun belts, um, also uh, stun vests and stun cuffs. They are worn sometimes for, for many hours at a time with the constant threat that they can be triggered at any moment. And in the case of stun belts, to deliver a 50,000 uh, volt shock via electrodes placed near the prisoner's kidneys. These devices have been manufactured by companies in the Americas, Africa and Asia and have been promoted by companies in all regions of the world. They have been used to control prisoners in certain countries in Africa, Asia and the Americas and their manufacture, trade and use must be prohibited. Uh, there's a wide range of uh, what we call direct contact electroshock weapons and devices, including shock batons, uh, stun guns and uh, shock shields. And they've been developed and marketed by companies in all regions, specifically for law enforcement use. And new products, uh, strange products sometimes, are coming onto the marketplace all the time, such as um, electroshock gloves 
promoted by companies based in the Americas, Asia and Europe and electroshock grabbing devices promoted by companies in Asia. Now, because all these weapons and devices allow the repeated application of extremely painful electric shocks at the push of a button, often without long lasting identifiable physical traces, their manufacture, trade and use by law enforcement officials must be prohibited. Um, We've also found um, a range of projectile electroshock weapons that fire darts connected by electrical wires to the launch device at an individual and can be used from a distance of several meters. The, dart, the darts attached to a person's body or clothing delivering an incapacitating high voltage electric shock that causes the subject to lose muscle control. Now such weapons, which are promoted by companies, again, in all world regions, have a potentially legitimate law enforcement function, but only in very limited standoff situations where an officer is facing or trying to prevent an imminent threat of death or serious injury and their trade consequently must be strictly controlled. Um, next are a range of mechanical restraints that we found. Now, if employed appropriately, um, in conformity with international human rights standards, notably, as mentioned before, the Nelson Mandela rules, certain mechanical restraints, such as ordinary handcuffs and leg cuffs, can be legitimately used to ensure the safe arrest and restraint of prisoners. However, they, of course, can be and are misused in, uh, in prisons and by police throughout the world. And so their transfer to law enforcement agencies must be strictly controlled. Now, in contrast, a number of companies have manufactured a range of mechanical restraints that severely restrict movement and which are likely to cause intense physical pain as well as mental suffering or risk serious injury to the prisoner. And they include uh, thumb cuffs, heavy, um, heavy leg irons, uh, bar fetters, neck restraints, metal restraint chairs, sometimes called inquest chairs, cage beds, and even restraints um, designed to be bolted directly to prison walls, floors, or ceilings. Now, the manufacture, trade, and use of all such inherently degrading or painful restraints must be prohibited. Uh, next, we come to um, kinetic impact weapons. Companies in all regions of the world have manufactured or promoted handheld kinetic impact weapons or striking weapons, such as batons and truncheons, or launched uh, kinetic impact weapons and projectiles, such as plastic and rubber bullets. These weapons are widely employed by law enforcement officials in public order policing, as well as in places of detention. Amnesty International has regularly documented their misuse in both custodial and extra custodial settings to inflict unnecessary or excessive force, which has amounted in certain cases to torture or other ill treatment, or has resulted in serious injury or death. Consequently, the trade in such uh, kinetic impact weapons, um, again, needs to be stringently controlled. In addition, Omega has uncovered the ongoing marketing to law enforcement agencies, mainly by Asian companies, of a range of inherently abusive and dangerous kinetic impact weapons and devices. They are designed to increase, not minimize, the amount of pain and injury inflicted on subjects. And certain types can cause skin tearing and puncture injuries. They include spiked batons, uh, spiked or serrated shields, and spiked arm armor. They clearly cannot be used for any legitimate law enforcement purpose and their manufacture, trade and use must be prohibited. Chemical irritants such as tear gas and pepper spray are commonly used around the world for law enforcement purposes, notably for dispersing crowds, as well as for facilitating arrest and restraint of individuals. However, they can easily be misused, including in prison cells and detention centers to ill treat and torture individuals, and during policing of public assemblies, potentially to facilitate ill treatment and punishment on a large scale. Omega has identified companies around the world that have manufactured or promoted chemical irritants and associated delivery mechanisms, such as grenades and cartridges, handheld sprayers or projectile uh, launchers that disperse limited amounts of chemical irritant over relatively short distances. Um, but, 
We've also found a growing number of systems capable of delivering far greater amounts of chemical irritants over wider areas or extended distances. They include uh, large capacity spraying devices, automatic grenade launchers, multi-barrel projectile launchers, and irritant dispersing drones. The trade in chemical irritants and associated delivery mechanisms needs to be controlled. With any delivery mechanism, deemed inherently inappropriate for law enforcement prohibited. Now, whilst professional training of police and prison officials in the appropriate use of law enforcement equipment can reinforce and operationalize human rights standards and good practices, Amnesty International and Omega have uncovered instances where law enforcement officials appear to have been trained in potentially abusive or dangerous methods. Such training, particularly if endorsed by senior law enforcement officials in the recipient countries, risks entrenching potentially abusive practices. For example, one European company uh, supplying security equipment also trains police forces in their use. This training includes employment of restraints to place prisoners in hyperextended positions, hog tying, and also in the use of batons for neck holds. Such techniques are similar to those the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture recommended be halted. And images and videos of the companies on the company's website show training in such techniques to a range of police forces in Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Americas. Tr training offered to law enforcement officials must be controlled. And training in the use of any prohibited goods, training in the misuse of any law enforcement equipment for torture or ill treatment, and training in other techniques employed for torture and ill treatment, including sleep deprivation and stress positions, must be prohibited. For too long, states have turned a blind eye to the trade in tools of torture, allowing companies throughout the world to profit from human pain and misery. All states have a responsibility to prevent torture and therefore to act decisively to bring this global trade under control. The current UN process provides a once in a generation opportunity for them to do so. For the sake of those daily under threat from torture and other ill treatment across the world, it's an opportunity that must not be squandered. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for enlightening us. These are uh, really some horrific tools. And thank you for your important work in this field. And let us now turn to Rajat. We've been informed by Michael that there's another report in the house. Rajat, can you tell us more about the perspective of Amnesty International and also about this re new report? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, SK. I would like to share my screen as well. Um, and. Uh, and, and, and take you through the details of uh, our work at Amnesty International and the report that has been mentioned. But uh, let me start uh, by thanking um, the European Union and the United Nations to bringing us together for this event today. It's a great opportunity and pleasure to join you, Excellencies, dear friends, in this conversation. Uh, as I said, my remarks uh, over the next few minutes are going to build pretty much about um, the issues that have been raised by Cecile early on by all the other speakers, but more particularly uh, by Michael. Earlier this year, Amnesty International researchers uncovered the brutal torture of migrants held in prisons and detention centers in the Middle East and North Africa region. This included the use of electric shock batons to punish de detainees criticizing their poor living conditions. One of the prisoners told Amnesty that the, they used the device on all of us on our backs. My skin became red. It was very painful. For two days, I could not sleep. These are not isolated stories, of dear friends and colleagues. These are examples of systemic abuse that is happening all around the world. Amnesty International, as you know, is a, has a long history of documenting torture and ill treatment and campaigning and advocating for a world free of these aberrant acts. The former UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Nigel Rodley, worked in the 1970s at Amnesty International as its international legal advisor and played a significant role in terms of the development and adoption of the Convention Against Torture, which came into force in 1987. 
And despite torture being absolutely prohibited under the international law over the last decade, Amnesty International has documented torture and other ill treatment in over 140 countries around the world. That is three quarters of the world stage that we are talking about. Since the mid 90s, uh, Amnesty International has worked in close partnership with Omega Research Foundation on one specific aspect of this practice, and that is the manufacture and trade in tools of torture, something that uh, Michael just elaborated. And we have been looking at implementation and techniques to use to carry out torture and other ill treatment. The tools of torture, inherently abusive equipment, for instance, certain electric shock devices or inhumane restraints like weighted leg irons, which need to be banned outright, and ordinary policing equipment such as batons and pepper spray, which requires strict human rights-based trade controls, details of which were shared in the previous presentation. This work has also covered controls on trade in goods used to carry out death penalty. We oppose the trade in equipment specifically designed to carry out the death penalty, such as guillotines and gas chambers, and call for strict control of dual use pharmaceuticals used in lethal injection protocols. Furthermore, earlier this year, uh, we, we are seeing standard policing equipment such as batons, handcuffs, tasers, and tear gas being used for torture and other ill treatment, yet often being traded freely with little concern about the potential human rights risk. For example, uh, earlier this year, Amnesty International produced a major investigation into the misuse of tear gas around the world. A close analysis of over 500 video conducted by us of some 80 events in 22 countries and territories uncovered multiple cases of misuse which met with thresholds of ill treatment. Incidents included tear gas being fired through the windscreens of cars, inside a school bus, at a funeral procession, inside hospitals, residential buildings, and metro stations. Police have fired canisters directly at individuals, leading to fatalities, as well as from speeding jeeps and drones. The present report uh, that I uh, would like to highlight and that has been launched today is the latest in a long sequence of reports that we have produced over the years in collaboration with Omega, ending the torture in trade, the path to global control on tools of torture. The report brings together cases of torture and ill treatment from across the world, both in custodial and non-custodial settings. These cases include the use of electric shock devices for torture in detention and on the street, the abusive use of crowd control equipment against peaceful protest protesters, the misuse of batons to administer beatings to detainees and protesters, and the misuse in law enforcement of inhumane restraints, such as restrained chairs, shackles, along with ordinary handcuffs. While states have clear obligation to control this potentially dangerous trait, the report also addresses the responsibility of companies to respect all human rights, including freedom from torture and other ill treatment wherever they operate. This is expressly recognized in global standards such as the UN guiding principles, which we have already talked about, and legal provisions for mandatory human rights due diligence for corporate actors are in process of being negotiated in several European states, which the previous speaker also talked about. The report summarizes the last 20 years of progress that has been made in this regard from series of UN resolution in the early 2000s to the introduction of binding law across the European Union, to the development of regulations and guidelines in Africa and the Council of Europe, to the creation of Alliance for Torture-Free Trade and the current UN process that we are discussing today. At each step of the way, Amnesty and Omega have been there helping drive these processes forward. The report also presents Amnesty and Omega's anti-torture trade framework, which sets out essential steps that we believe states must take into account to regulate the trade in law enforcement and in terms of death penalty goods. The anti-torture framework gives our view on items that should be regulated 
be they prohibited goods or goods whose trade should be strictly regulated and subjected to strict human rights risk assessments, calls for prohibition on the provision of training in torture techniques such as the misuse of prohibited or controlled equipment or other techniques such as sleep deprivation and stress positions. And also details measures to support these controls such as an urgency procedure for updating control list and official channels for international cooperation and information sharing, which is vital in this regard. We hope that the anti-torture trade framework can help inform and support the current UN process that is underway. Amnesty and Omega would welcome the opportunity to discuss the framework with the states as they consider their position, and we stand ready to assist the group of government experts in their important deliberations next year. There are three po critical points regarding the framework that I would like to highlight uh, in this regard. The first is in terms of goods covered by state and global regulation need to be wide in scope. A global field research shows that torture and other ill treatment is often carried out by simplest and the least ex uh, expensive types of law enforcement equipment. So there must be strict trade controls, not just on tasers uh, or pepper spray, but also the most basic equipment like simple hemp cups and police batons. Second, regulations have to capture the fact that torture and other ill treatment happens outside of detention settings, most prominently in policing of public assembly. As the current special rapporteur on torture has so convincingly argued, torture ill treatment happens not just in more controlled environments or custody, but what he has described as the wilderness of the street. Our field research has found that ill treatment of protesters is a growing and extremely serious problem. So it is essential any trade regulations cover crowd control equipment such as tear gas, rubber bullets, and related launchers, and that this is and that this equipment is subject to strict human rights-based trade controls as well. And finally, any global regulation must be legally binding with adequate safe, uh, safeguards and resources to allow robust enforcement. This includes provision for mutual assistance, information sharing, regular reviews of banned controlled goods to keep pace with what is sadly a fast developing area of innovation. To conclude, the more countries join the efforts to put to the uh, to torture trade, the better chances we have to succeed in our efforts to stop it. Without global cooperation, national and regional measures risk being undermined by renegade states and companies. The UN can play a vital role in bringing together states to support this initiative and take a lead in the development of strict global regulations on this. We owe this to the countless individuals featured in our report who have been shackled, subjected to electric shocks and beaten, and to all those who have been pepper sprayed, tear gassed, and met with hails of rubber bullets in deliberately punitive acts simply for peaceful protesting. Thank you. Thank you, Rajat. I do hope that the anti-torture framework you lay out in the report will serve as an inspiration for the global legal framework in the making. And I would encourage our audience to have a look at this report as well. I had a chance to read it before the event and I can tell you all that it's a very informative source and it will bring you up to speed about this insidious trade. I believe colleagues from Omega Research Foundation and Amnesty International shared the link to this report in the chat function. Please have a look at it. Now I would like to turn to Professor Nowak, who has been an influential figure in the fight against torture. He previously served as a special reporter on torture. Professor Nowak, relying on your expertise in this issue, can you tell us about the state of global torture prohibition regime and the range of state practices you observed? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Joseph, for this uh, excellent uh, webinar that we are having this conference. Um, <clears throat> um, when I was Special Rapporteur on Torture between 2004 and 2010, um, I already, my, my predecessor already published a report uh, that uh, the torture trade must be prohibited, Theo van Boven, um, and uh, that also led to the first uh, the first EU regulation. Uh, during the six years, uh, I carried out 18 fact-finding missions. 
uh, in all regions of the world. And I try to have a representative sample of countries. Uh, so also those where I didn't expect torture, only one country that in that time it was Denmark and Greenland, uh, I didn't find any evidence of torture, but it means in 17 of the 18 countries, and that is about 90%, um, I, I found torture, sometimes isolated cases, um, but I would say that in more than 50% of the states, torture is practiced in a routine manner. Um, and it's not primarily against governmental uh, opponents. It is simply because the police is not well trained, um, not well paid also. Um, and uh, very often they have these kind of um, instruments at use uh, rather than the more sophisticated methods of evidence taking such as fingerprints or DNA or whatever. Um, and uh, there's a lot of pressure on the police uh, to solve a crime. Um, and it means that they are trying to arrest somebody who looks suspicious of people who already have been sentenced for, for a crime, people who are homeless, the marginalized, the poor. Um, and they are then arrested and uh, they are tortured until they confess to the crime they, they are accused of. Um, and uh, so it's it's a very kind of not what is often uh, thought of that it is primarily for political reasons. No, it's the everyday practice of the police. And I found torture in in about ten percent of the countries to be systematic. So it's really a government um, a government policy uh, to to use torture. So it is uh, more widely practiced than uh, I actually had uh, had expected, and I had already quite a long experience in dealing uh, with with torture issues. And I, uh, if I read the reports of my successors, uh, Juan Mendes and, and Niels Melzer, um, I don't have the feeling that the situation improved a lot. So I think it is about uh, about the same as uh, what I actually found. Thank you for sharing these insights, Professor Nowak. I also would like to ask you about the broader developments that brought us here to the, to the day, to this moment, because uh, the global anti-torture regime has strong preventative goals, and uh, you, would, you can tell us more about that. Wouldn't that mean that states have already an obligation to prevent trade in torture tools already? I mean, the UN Convention Against Torture of 1984, <clears throat> which was primarily a reaction uh, to the systematic practice of torture in the Latin American military dictatorships of the 1970s, um, that is a convention on prevention because the absolute prohibition is already written down in the in the Universal Declaration in the Covenant in many regional instruments. So we don't need the convention to prohibit torture. It is a convention to prevent torture by whatever means. Some of them are written, like for instance, a better training of law enforcement personnel uh, to review interrogation methods, uh, not to use. Um, any kind of confessions extracted by torture as evidence in criminal and other proceedings. Uh, of course, there are many other preventive methods, in particular that police custody should be as short as possible, because that's the time when torture is happening immediately after the arrest, that detainees should have a right to be immediately brought before a lawyer, before a judge, have access to a doctor, family, etc. Um, so there are many preventive measures. But then there's an optional protocol uh, for the prevention of torture, which says that all those places where torture can or is actually happening, and these are places of detention, torture usually takes place during interrogation in a remote and, and, and secret place. Um, and uh, in order to, to, so preventive visits to places of detention really had an impact in the prevention. And I would think it is, but it's a very general obligation to prevent. And of course, there are and many of the instruments uh, that, that, that Michael and, and Rajat have just shown us, I have found in so many uh, 
torture centers in so many police custody, military custody, intelligence, etc., around the world. They exist and they are used. So uh, if we want to prevent torture, that is one, and I would think a fairly an effective manner, additionally to many other methods to prevent the practice of torture. Thank you, Professor. So, as I hear you, I also agree with this. This obligation could be strengthened, highlighted with a new framework that specifically highlights that states should not trade in these tools. Maybe at this moment, uh, it's right time to ask about the benefits and disadvantages of introducing a new regime on that can ban trade in tools of torture. And maybe we can also, uh, after Professor Nowak, uh, turn to Michael and Ra Rajat and starting to open the floor to others as well. But first, uh, Professor Nowak. No, I, I was very encouraged also by reading the report of the Secretary General um, that uh, clearly says that of the 46 states that have responded, uh, the, the, the majority clearly opted for a binding uh, treaty or any kind of binding instrument to prohibit, um, on the one hand, uh, um, instruments that can only be used for torture or for the death penalty, uh, and strictly regulate uh, others that might have a legitimate purpose for law enforcement, but could easily be misused. Um, whether this is um, an, a new treaty, or what I would think would be the, the most appropriate, uh, a second optional protocol to the United Nations Convention Against Torture, um, uh, that is less important. But I think something like that uh, should be developed by the Human Rights Council um, of the United Nations um, and very much also inspired by the EU regulations on torture-free trade. Thank you, Professor. I would like to now open the floor for further questions before uh, turning to Michael and Rajat. I just want people to use this opportunity to raise their hands or write questions in the chat function. I will try to collect few of them and turn to our panelists and speakers from the previous session as well, those who are still remaining with us. But before that, uh, let me turn quickly to Rajat. Thank you. Thank you very much, AK. I, I'm very much agreeing with, uh, with, with Manfred on his uh, assessment uh, in, in, in this regard. I think um, for Amnesty International, the goal is, uh, the ultimate goal is prevention of torture. Um, as this is an international issue um, involving trade between states, it needs an international solution. Um, in our view, um, an international legally binding instrument would uh, would send a very clear message of intent and signal to both state parties and companies which the softer approaches may lack. Um, but at the same time, what we do need is compliance and implementation across the board to curb these practices. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael, do you wanna weigh in on this as well? Yeah, just uh, quickly uh, to yeah to th uh, thank Manfred for for his interventions, which are are, are uh, born of his uh, direct experiences um, of investigating the practices that we're all concerned to stop, and also the tools that are used for those practices. So uh, very much you know listening to to what he he is saying. Um, I I agree um, that we have to you know explore all the options and the GGE process is a is a way to uh, to do that. But I I st strongly endorse um, not surprisingly what Rajat said uh, about um, the need for a binding um, international um, instrument. I think in this area. Uh, um, because it mixes uh, and joins uh, human rights uh, concerns and also trade concerns, um, states and the companies want the, uh, the greatest possible clarity in the controls that will be uh, um, introduced. And I believe that that, that clarity comes from, from uh, uh, legally binding uh, measures, because we're part of our concern is to establish national control regimes um, that that states have to implement and that companies have to be clear 
uh, about how to uh, uh, interact with. And all that needs uh, um, a proper um, uh, and clear regulatory uh, uh, framework. Also, I think it's, again, very important that when we're talking about this, that the international instrument is um, it's international. So the, the legal instrument is international because again, um, companies want, uh, they want clarity, but they also want um, uh, a level playing field. They they want to be, be sure that the, um, the measures that are introduced, which in effect constrain uh, um, trade and then um, prohibit certain trade will um, cover all companies and all states. So I think um, there, are, you know, there are reasons that this uh, process needs to be international, and uh, that it needs to be uh, to have a legally uh, binding uh, basis. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I have a list of speakers now. I would like to start with uh, Ambassador Martin Herman from the Permanent Representative of Denmark. Ambassador, no, the floor is yours. No, thank, thank, thank you for giving me the floor, Dr. Dr. Yildiz, and, and thanks to all the all the panelists from, from, from what I thought was more really sort of hard hitting, but also sort of very pointed and, um, and, and, and relevant interventions. Now, I mean, I don't need to tell you that Denmark's a very, very dedicated ally in the, in the fight against torture and ill treatment, and we've been so for, for, for decades. I mean, for, for us, the, the law is clear, no? the prohibition against the torture is, is absolute, but it's also clear, of course, the torture is to some extent, you know, enabled by the trade of, of various goods, as we saw uh, some, some examples. And Denmark's a very, very strong proponent of, of the need for, for international standards uh, to prevent uh, such trade. I mean, no one should be able to make a profit from inflicting serious pain and, and, and suffering uh, on, on, on others. Now, I mean, we, we applaud the report very much on different approaches towards torture free trade and, 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 and look forward actually uh, forward to, to the work on establishing international. Uh, Guideline. As, as some of you will know, Denmark has provided uh, the, the expertise of, of, of Asger Kjærum uh, as the WEAG representatives uh, in the UN Group of Governmental Experts. I think Asger is here also uh, today and really encourage the remaining uh, regional groups to nominate their representatives so we can allow the group you know, to, to, initiate, uh, to initiate this work. One thing is establishing uh, guidelines, establishing mandates, you know, uh, issuing declarations, but ultimately, you know, uh, the work needs to be uh, taken forward. I, I do know that, and I think some some has mentioned this uh, in, in the Secretary General's report on, on, on towards torture-free trade, uh, there is actually specific mentioning of, of, of EU uh, regulations, which regulates uh, the trade in goods uh, used for capital punishment of, and torture or other uh, cruel, inhumane and, and degrading treatment. Uh, I mean, and um, Part of the challenge, of course, here is, is to try and get as many best practices out there, to get the good examples out there, so we can address. I think what 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 Professor Novak uh, mentioned that, that this is, of course, not always systematic. This is also a question of capacity building, of training and education, and making sure that people have the tools available at their hands that they need, and not uh, the, the 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 wrong uh, tools at their hand. Now, I would be a bad uh, representative of Denmark if I didn't take note. Of, of, of what Professor Novak said, that actually he didn't find any, in any, uh, any systematic cruel, uh, inhumane, or degrading treatment uh, in in Denmark when, when he undertook a visit uh, there. This is, of course, a source of crime, but actually it, did, it it ought not to be because this ought to be what was the reality for all of us. Now, I, th I think the challenge, to some extent, is how can we how can we help and assist also those authorities that need to, to so we need to make sure that they have the right tools available, whether this is techniques or or, or more uh, physical tools, and definitely not uh, the wrong tools. Now, you know, the the reality, of course, is that that when the Secretary General was looking for some of uh, the examples, some of the practices to need. No? Um, you know, only 46 uh, member states responded out of 193. Only of, these, uh, only 20, of these were 25 member states of the European Union. So, so my question to the panel is, you know, how can we ensure uh, broader participation and engagement from states across all regions in actually uh, in the further process of establishing common uh, international standards? Because I do think that this is a need. This, of course, is the whole approach that that, that an initiative that Denmark is part of uh, the Convention Against Torture initiative, but actually cease to to reach out to uh, to, uh, to to partners and friends uh, across regions to discuss how you overcome some of the challenges that are in actually in implementing uh, the convention that you that you ratified. But uh, but the question uh, essentially is, you know, how can we actually 
uh, ensure broader uh, participation and engagement from states uh, across all regions to, to further this uh, process of, of establishing uh, international standards. Thanks. Thank you, Ambassador. I would like to collect uh, two other questions before turning back to the panel. Next on my list, I see uh, Kerry Norton. Kerry, are you here? Hi, yes, I am here. Thank you very much. I'm a journalist for Le Monde and uh, a few francophone radios like RFI or the Swiss RTS. Um, I know, uh, thank you very much uh, for the panel. It's very interesting and thanks for the details. We need, uh, especially journalists, to make uh, all these reports more lively and to explain them better to our editors. So it's needed. So thank you very much. Uh, I understand, Michael, I heard in uh, during your presentation that you don't have any uh, official figures of the trade, uh, but uh, and for obvious reasons, but would you have, though, an estimation how big, how large is this trade, this torture trade globally, please? Thank you, Carrie. Uh, now, next on my list, I see Asker from the International Rehabilitation for Torture Victims. Hey, Asker. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for giving me the floor. Um, just very briefly, this has been a very enriching discussion. I think right now I'm really in the listening mode and because this is such a complex and, and rich area of, uh, of the fight against torture that, that many of my colleagues have been working on for, uh, for decades. So, so I'm really trying to listen. Right now I have one question, but I don't want it to detract from, from Carrie's question before. Uh, so, so please keep it until later, but, but just uh, much uh, more technically, um, we find ourselves in, in a situation where we're trying to regulate and monitor something that's partly uh, human rights and partly trade, right? And, and when we talk about the international monitoring of a possible future uh, legal instrument, uh, I wonder if some of the discussions has given any thought to um, how to actually create a meaningful mechanism for that, since it's not quite like what we're used to, um, and whether that actually has any impact on how we would try to do international monitoring, or whether we think that the same uh, instruments that we have, so the Committee Against Torture or something like that, would be up, up to the task or what would be needed. But but please go to Kerry first, because I think that's much more important right now. Yeah, uh, But uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, Asker. Uh, I also had a very burning question because uh, before we lost uh, Madam Commissioner, uh, she was talking about the UN uh, process, the group of experts process. Maybe Cecile uh, can tell us a bit more about the steps, future steps. Where are we at that as well? Just wanted to briefly ask this. But now I would like to return to uh, panelists and speakers. Anyone who is available who wants to answer the questions, we had like three excellent questions. Please take the floor. Again, maybe I can, and also with apologies, because I do have to leave for another uh, meeting uh, momentarily. I um, particularly appreciate the uh, question from uh, Ambassador uh, from Denmark um, and, and kind of uh, the, the, the last uh, statement as well. And I think um, one of the things that we must strive to achieve is how do we broaden the tent um, through this conversation and what are the approaches that can help us build alliances with countries um, and partners in relation to this. We do have experience in terms of doing this. Um, the experience on uh, the arms trade treaty in terms of the work that has been done uh, in terms of cluster munitions, et cetera, has provided us with a with a level of understanding and impetus uh, in terms of how do we build those bridges and uh, and some good practice ideas on 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 how um, this can be implemented because as I think Oscar was very rightly saying um, I think it is one thing to achieve the instrument um, whatever shape or form that it might be but if it is being um, you know blatantly being violated what good it is and I think the implementation perspective on how we ensure compliance and regular monitoring is something that will be critical to these efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? We had really great yeah. questions, so jump in. Okay. Yeah, shall I try and respond uh, to the question about size, which is 
yeah, impossible, I would say. Um, uh, without, uh, yeah, we're in a, a really tricky position because without adequate state regulation and, we've, and we, without adequate regulation by all states and licensing of the trade, then you can't have any accurate figures on the scale and nature of that trade. Unless uh, uh, there's effective regulation, then you're not going to get um, the figures um, which we all want and the information which we all want, um, because we need that information as well to try and hold companies and states to account. So without state regulation, that information is not there. At present, only a minority of states regulate the trade in law enforcement equipment, and, and the nature of that regulation um, is different for, for different states. So there's differences in the range of equipment controlled and uh, that require licensing and the criteria for allowing transfers and denying transfers is different in different states. And even states that, that regulate the trade, they don't provide regular and full details of that trade uh, to civil society or you know, to the public. And um, they mostly only give an indication of the licenses granted and denied, which don't give us any information about the specific inf uh, equipment exported, who the end users are, or the quantities. And without full state information pr provision, it's it's just impossible for us to discover the true scale and, and the nature of the trade. However, we can get glimpses, indications um, of the trade from open sources and, and from invest investigations. Firstly, we can see where some of the equipment has uh, turned up and that's, we get some of that information from, from uh, uh, the UN and regional anti-torture bodies and non-governmental human rights organizations that are becoming increasingly aware of uh, the tools of torture and ill treatment. So, um, in the past, uh, uh, monitors have concentrated uh, um, on the victim and the nature of the abuse, and in a lot of cases, haven't recorded the instruments being used to conduct torture and ill treatment. Um, uh, we in Omega and Amnesty and other organizations have tried to encourage that sensitization in, in the monitors uh, and in those who report abuses to, to look at the equipment being used so that we can try and identify uh, where it comes from and who makes it. Um, and we, uh, um, in terms of Omega, do, do what we can to, to, to uh, monitor the arms and security fares, the company products and the marketing materials to, to again, to give an, an indication of, of what companies are making and where they're, they're, they're promoting uh, their goods. Now, certain commercial organizations ha have attempted to, to forecast market developments in, in this area and give an indication of the current scale of the global trade. So, um, you know, whilst I'll, I'd say the inherently abusive equipment is made by a relatively small number of companies in, uh, and, you know, it, it is, you know, quite, quite, certain aspects are quite niche. When it comes to non-lethal weapons, you know that is a big trade. Things like tear gas, pepper spray, uh, rubber bullets, plastic bullets, batons, restraints. You know that is a big industry. And um, according to to one anal analysis, uh, the non-lethal weapons market is uh, expected to uh, garner nine thousand six hundred and fifty-six million dollars um, by two thousand and twenty-two. So it's a big. It's a big market. So there's one part of it, which is, we believe, quite small. And then uh, the bigger um, non-lethal weapons, uh, less lethal weapons marketplace is, is far larger. But again, without state regulation, it's impossible for us, uh, for me to give a, a proper um, figure to you. So apologies for that. I also just wanted to say uh, and endorse what, what Rajat said and what the Danish representative said that, um, we all, civil society and states, need to engage with partners uh, across the world now to, to build a true uh, global alliance on, on this issue. Uh, but there are really you know, strong forums and, and, and pockets of uh, interest and um, activism by civil society and states that, that we can build on. Um, 
the the uh, the global uh, the alliance for torture free trade had has over 60 states from all world regions so not just the eu and not just europe from all world regions and those um states have committed themselves to to um trying to establish uh, global uh, a global instrument on on this issue and i think it's uh, be, uh, it behoves them to 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 now fulfill their commitments and try and engage in in bilateral communications with their their neighbors and and with all the states they interact with to try and convince them uh, to develop controls in this area similarly um, we've got regional organizations like the Council of Europe uh, like the EU but also um, the African Commission on on human rights um, developed, uh, adopted, sorry, the, um, the Robben Island guidelines in 2002, which incorporated a, a, an obligation, a commitment by states to prevent and prohibit the um, production, trade and use of um, inherently abusive equipment. Thank um, you, Michael. Uh, sorry, apologies, because we are running out of time. Okay, sorry, and, I'll uh, stop. Anyway, so yeah, I'm just that, apologies. Yeah, a regional basis uh, that we can build on. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Nowak. Yeah, thank you very much. I would like to respond to Oscar's uh, question. I think you are right. We are in the, really in the area of business and human rights, and uh, we should think about uh, also what are other mechanisms to monitor. I think, first of all, if we have a, a second optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture or any other instrument, we must be very, very clear. There must be a clear appendix that clearly says these are instruments that are prohibited and those are ones that need further control. Um, and then I think uh, we should not uh, simply leave it to the Committee Against Torture because they are already overworked with looking at state reports, etc. We need an investigative body. Um, so a body, and that can be similar to the SPT, an international body, I would actually prefer, and I think um, the, the, the recent developments with the national preventive mechanisms are actually quite good. So uh, the experience is if they are really independent, then they can do quite a lot. So as they are carrying out unannounced visits to places of detention, they might also carry out unannounced visits to companies that are manufacturing uh, this, this kind of products uh, and also looking into the trade. So uh, an effective monitoring would need investigation on the ground in any case. Thank you, Professor Nowak. Um, I was wondering if uh, someone from the OECHR could take up the question about the uh, uh, governmental experts. Sure, yes, um, happy to, to, to do so. Thank you very much for, for this opportunity. So um, this group of governmental experts that the General Assembly of the UN requested the Secretary General to establish led to first a process where regional groups were invited to nominate experts. Um, and this was done to ensure equitable geographic distribution among the experts. The final deadline for nomination was very uh, recent. It was on, on the 30th of November. So we hope now that the group will be established really in the coming weeks. Once the group is established, um, it will have the responsibility to decide on its own timeline, the timeline of its work, of the consultations. And, and we as the Secretariat will be very happy to support. We know though that the General Assembly required the group to submit its report by the end of the 75th session of the General Assembly, which will end by 31st of August next year. So it's a relatively short timeline. And, and we truly hope that there will be no further delays and that the group can meet that deadline. Um, it's also important to say that the group will have the opportunity to consult states, civil societies, etc. And as the Secretariat, we are going to make sure that we provide the group with the views expressed in different fora, including, for instance, today's event. As I have the floor, may I just um, send on behalf of the High Commissioner uh, Bachelet, you know that Michelle Bachelet was unfortunately disconnected the second time, so she sends her greetings and thanks. 
um, the, the, she was cut before the end of her remarks. So, so let me just um, uh, really underline that she, um, it, it's very, very clear for the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights that the, the struggle to end all forms of torture is very much at the forefront of our mandate. It's also very clear that international law already clearly unconditionally prohibits torture, that no derogations are permitted. And, and so the fact that goods whose only purpose are to inflict torture or ill-treatment on, on human beings um, are still being produced or traded is, is really something that we find abhorrent. We are very aware, and that was the point that the High Commissioner wanted to make um, and that she was cut short to do, is that this fight is not a regional or sectoral issues. It is truly in everyone's interest to, to move forward on this. Um, the Global Alliance was just mentioned. The Global Alliance has been providing a strong, fresh impetus for this necessary, necessary movement. As OHHR and the High Commissioner, we really hope that many more countries will join these efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Laptel. Uh, so I see uh, Ambassador, uh, Madam Ambassador, their comments uh, wants to take the floor. Madam Ambassador. It's a suggestion or a proposal. There are a, a, a lot of countries uh, very hard in uh, trade agreements. It is a big country, a middle income country, and a small country. And believe one possibility is thinking about of the limited the preferences in trade when the countries use this kind of element of instrument. Really, we are is common in trade, com, trade agreement to uh, evocate human right and environment. But it's believed is a possibility to concrete, in the case of human rights, concrete in some sanction or some uh, minimum benefit in trade. No? Okay, it's obviously is no uh, preferential trade with one uh, weapon of that we saw in the Im image, but my uh, my proposal is in other products is in other products for the country has used this methodology okay what is the the attitude with the other kind of product in the trade only that thank you thank you very much Thank you, Madam Ambassador. I have uh, two questions from the floor, so I'll read them out. One is, uh, the first one is going to all the panelists. It's from Lionel Grassi. So he says, we are among convinced people, but wouldn't it be more important to mobilize companies in this process? So my question would be, are there already companies involved in this process and how, what can we do to integrate them? I believe, um, Michael and uh, Rajat, I think Rajat is leaving his, his colleague Patrick can tell us about this aspect and uh, linking to their report. Uh, and also Professor Noah can also weigh in this. Another question, this one goes to um, uh, the EU uh, actually. I would like to ask the EU representatives whether there are uh, ongoing efforts to link up initiatives on torture free trade and discussions regarding a common arms export policy of EU member states. Maybe Madame uh, Hardeman can uh, talk about this aspect. Thank you. Hi, um, this is, is Patrick uh, uh, from Amnesty International. Yes, I mean, I think I, I was very heartened by the fact that um, Companies came up so strongly um, in all the presentations, and I think, as I agree with Professor Novak, that um, we're in an age of you know companies taking much more responsibility and expected to carry out their own due diligence. Um, and I think there is some good practice um, in this area, and what's which we stress in the report. Um, for example, the pharmaceutical companies have been proactive, and they have taken actions to prevent their dual use. Um, drugs from being used in lethal injection protocols in the US. Um, so there has been a cross-industry 
action on that. And there's no reason why that couldn't be transferred into other areas um, where, of you know, companies that produce, for instance, uh, crowd control equipment. Uh, we've seen uh, it, it, whenever we've tried to reach out to companies and ask what their kind of human rights due diligence policies are, we, we see scant um, action on, on that front. And we will continue to try and press for that um, in, in the coming years. Thank you, Patrick. Um, anyone else who wants to weigh in on this? May I add something to, to the question on how to involve the business community? Because I, I mentioned that um, there is a strong link of our topic with uh, the general business and human rights debate. And I think it is not only an intellectual link, but also one that could be used to make uh, these efforts known to a broader community because at the UN level there are lots of initiatives there's the permanent forum on business and human rights so there is a, a lot there are a lot of possibilities to reach out to the community and I think this is um, a way to involve um, business uh, companies and um, have them see the problem and contribute to a solution. Yeah, if I may also add uh, that, uh, as I said, we are in the middle of business and human rights. There is there are various initiatives. Uh, there's a general initiative at the at the Human Rights Council to draft a treaty um, on, on on business and human rights in order to create binding obligations on on business. And I, um, if if the the European Union uh, would also be stronger involved in a positive way uh, to to find uh, to find a solution there. And of course, in such a context, of course, certain companies. And I'm thinking, for instance, on private military and security companies, where there's another initiative to have a special treaty. And then we are talking about arms trade, and we're talking now about torture trade or trade in torture instruments uh, that might then have a, a specific focus in such a treaty. But I think in the long term, if we simply work with the the, the guiding principles, the Wagi principles as such, it is always still voluntary. And it's especially those companies that are really deliberately produce and manufacture um, torture instruments uh, uh, will not be reached by, by this voluntary guiding principles of the, of the United Nations on business and human rights. Thank you, Professor Nowak. I think this has been a fascinating debate. We learned so much. And what stood particularly to me that we really need a common standard right now about this so that it can serve as a focal point for all relevant stakeholders. And this will help us also reinvigorate our commitment to fight against torture. I would encourage you all to continue this discussion. And I know there, there are other important issues lingering, but we must continue with our program as well. It's my now pleasure to invite Hilda Herdeman, Head of services from the foreign policy instruments to offer her closing remarks. Thank you so much. Maybe first a word uh, on a question that was asked, um, that is on the role of business. Uh, indeed, as, as it has been mentioned by several participants, uh, business pharmaceutical companies play a crucial role uh, in implementing the EU regulation, but of course the EU regulation also has um, an enforcement arm uh, in this sense that other companies that uh, are in breach uh, of the regulation uh, can be sanctioned and member states have put in place specific sanctions uh, for this purpose. As to the question relating to the arms trade treaty, uh, the EU is, is working um, on the EU's expert control tool, toolbox to respond effectively to evolving security risks and emerging uh, technologies. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, the arms trade treaty can be a source of inspiration for work uh, in that direction. Now, more, more widely, uh, if we look back uh, at the fantastic debate uh, that we have uh, uh, just had. Um, 
I would like to say that I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to close this event with reflections from the side of the European Commission, which in the European Union is in charge of the European Union's own anti-torture regulation. And I would like to start by recalling what I see as the main takeaways of today's discussion before sharing with you some ideas on how the Commission plans to further advance its own work in this area. Together, we have all covered a lot of ground since 2017, when the Alliance for Torture Free Trade was launched. From the 2017 declaration through the 2019 United Nations General Assembly resolution, and right up to the recent UN Secretary General report, we have seen a growing recognition that action to ensure torture free trade is urgently required. High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, made it very clear torture strips away the essence of the human being. Still, despite an absolute prohibition of torture under international law, acts of torture and other ill treatment continue to occur. That is why she called to stop and eradicate such illegal practices through swift and decisive action using every relevant means, not least international standards for torture free trade. Our own EU Special Representative Eamon Gilmore underlined the EU's total commitment to the universal prohibition of capital punishment, torture and other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. And that is why, as one of the tools in the EU's fight against torture and for the eradication of the death penalty, the EU applies strict restrictions to trade in such goods. Eamon Gilmore underlined that the EU is strongly committed to supporting the quest for torture free trade beyond its own borders and will continue to encourage and facilitate the introduction of restrictions, controls and limits inspired by the EU anti-torture regulation. He made it clear that we can eradicate such practices if we act together creatively and in a multifaceted manner. Ms. Cecile Aptel from the Office of the High Commissioner emphasized the significance of the recent report from the UN Secretary General. She recalled how the report underscores that establishing common international standards for torture-free trade could ensure more effective regulation in the area and that it references the EU regulation in various parts of the report as best practice. Today, we also learned about progress towards establishing a dedicated UN governmental group of experts. We very much look forward to seeing this group established and working in a positive spirit of cooperation. Clearly, this group will need to tackle challenging questions of legal, practical and other nature. For example, what should be the nature and form of a future global instrument? What should be the scope and category of goods covered? To what extent possible new standards should provide for the prohibition and or control of trade? How to define criteria for conducting risk assessments and end use verification mechanisms? Or how to avoid creating unnecessary barriers to trade in goods that are used for legitimate purposes? When it comes to our civil society partners, they indicated what they see as essential elements of a possible instrument. They highlighted several complex and sensitive issues for the group to consider and called for making the most of the avenues for real progress that are opened by the ongoing discussions at global level. Their active involvement is absolutely essential. We really welcome your input, civil society partners, and we thank you so much for your work. Now, let me now take you back just for a moment to the EU's own work. Several independent experts confirm that the EU regulation is effective and that it has tangible impact. As the world's first legally binding regulatory instrument in this area, and thanks to its effectiveness and impact, it has served. It serves as an example for the development of similar measures by third countries and international organizations. And we are very much encouraged by the recent initiative at the Council of Europe on which Dr. Nicola Wenzel elaborated. This initiative seeks 
the adoption of a recommendation of the Committee of Ministers to Council of Europe member states on measures against trade of goods used for the death penalty, torture or other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. And such a measure would expand the efforts internal to the EU to the wider European region. Now, within the EU itself, we are very strongly aware that the work is never finished. It requires daily efforts and one needs to work every day to stay ahead of the curve. And that is why we conducted this year a review of the EU's own anti-torture regulation. This review has shown that while the uh, regulation really works, there remains further work to do notably and in particular when it comes to implementation. And that is why the Commission will establish its own informal group of experts to advise it on strengthening the EU regulation and its effective implementation. The Commission's group of experts will provide a platform for systematic interaction with a wide range of stakeholders, including EU member states authorities, non-governmental organizations, business, very important partner, international organizations and other actors with relevant expertise in the field. Now to conclude, our discussion today shows that there is clear momentum to continue work for global torture-free trade. To stop torture and the death penalty, we must act together and develop common ground. And we can do so if we really want. So thank you very much for your contribution and engagement. Together, we really can make a difference. Thank you all. And thank you. Your call for action is well received. I, I have to say this has been an amazing uh, discussion, amazing event. We covered a range of issues. It was informative and rich discussion and we heard inspiring and encouraging speeches. Uh, engagement from our panelists and speakers, it was all wonderful. I would like to also thank our audience for raising such important and interesting questions and staying so engaged. I want to acknowledge the person who asked a second question, Moritz Norbert, sorry, I didn't state your name earlier, apologies for that. I would like to also encourage, uh, also thank our organizers who took care of everything from New York to Geneva, they were really involved and thanks to them, everything went out so smoothly. I would like to leave you with one message. Let us continue this conversation and let us join our forces to bring this to life, this initiative to life. Time is ripe and everyone can and should do their part. I welcome the call uh, to, that invited us uh, citizens, private citizens, civil society or academics to uh, help in ways uh, we can. And I think we are ready. Thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Let's Thank you, Eski, for great today. moderation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Eski. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you very much.